Purchasing solar panels for your home can be an exciting and straightforward process. However, because getting a quote for solar and signing up can be so easy, it also means it's just as easy to make mistakes without even realizing it. So in this video, we're going to be going over the seven mistakes that you must avoid at all costs, mistakes that could totally destroy and ruin your experience when going solar. And the best part about all of this is that these mistakes are actually super easy to prevent as long as you watch the video until the end. So the first and probably worst mistake that you can make when going solar is not actually purchasing your solar panel system. Now you might be thinking, well, what are you talking about, Jack? Of of course, when I go solar, I'm going to own my own solar panel system. But unfortunately, that's not always the case. In 2025, it's increasingly common for solar installers to sell solar to their customers in the form of a PPA or TPO, meaning a solar lease. Solar installers do this because they not only make a lot more profit over the duration of a solar lease, but it's also very easy for their salespeople to trick the customers into believing the benefits of the renting versus owning. You see, solar installers are always playing this game of trying to figure out how to make the highest profit possible with an installation while also maintaining a relatively high closing percentage for their salespeople. A few years ago, interest rates were extremely low, so companies were selling solar to homeowners at 1-3% to APR, and that was working very well for them. But times changed, and now in 2025, with rates being as high as they are, many installers have decided to rent solar panel systems to homeowners instead of pricing their bids at cash price. When a homeowner signs a PPA or TPO, it means that they're renting the panels from the solar installer typically over 20 to 25 years, and making monthly payments along the way. These monthly payments are often lower than what the homeowner was previously paying on their power bill, so the numbers generally work out for immediate savings. Now, there's going to be a few caveats which they won't tell you. So number one, your monthly payment will often escalate by 2 to 3%, and that happens every single year. And this escalation compounds, meaning that by year 20 or 25, your monthly payment could have doubled compared to what it was in year one. Number two, you won't be eligible for any state or federal tax credits. So all of the credits that you could have received, including the 30% residential solar federal tax credit and any state or utility incentives, all of those will be claimed by your solar installer. And number three, selling your home with a leased solar panel system can be very challenging to do. In fact, it could actually lower your home's value. You'll likely have to sell your home with the stipulation that the new homeowner takes over your monthly payments, a condition that very few buyers would want to accept. And if the lease people People tell you that you can pay off the system early to avoid that. Yes, that's a possibility. However, they'll massively inflate the buyout price in the contract to do so, making an early repayment typically a poor financial decision. Solar panels manufactured today can last upwards of 50 years, so I highly encourage you to view your solar investment from a long-term perspective rather than focusing on something that offers the lowest monthly payment simply in that first year. Now, don't get me wrong, there are some instances in which a lease could be beneficial to a homeowner, such as if they're ineligible for any tax credits or they just need the immediate low monthly savings savings, but you really want to make sure that you discuss all of the options with your solar consultant so that you can make the best long-term decision for your home. Moving on, the second common mistake that first-time solar homeowners make is not understanding their specific net metering situation and how it impacts how they have to design their solar panel system. Now, unlike other countries in the world, in America, the private sector accounts for the majority of power companies, and each of them offers a fairly different program for homeowners looking into residential solar. If you're not already aware, the majority of rooftop solar panel systems are grid-tied, meaning they're connected to the local power power grid. This setup works because during afternoon periods where solar panels produce power, they often generate more energy than what the house actually uses, and that extra power needs to go somewhere, so it can be pushed back onto the grid and then sold to other homeowners in the area. And since the power company didn't generate that electricity, they provide a credit to the solar homeowner, which can then be used to offset nighttime electricity usage. This system works very well and allows many homeowners across the country to design systems that offset their entire annual power consumption. Even though the systems don't produce at night, homeowners can rely on credits. However, this option is not available to everybody. In parts of the country, such as Hawaii, California, and Arizona, so many homeowners adopted solar that utility companies had to move away from offering the traditional one-to-one -one net metering program. So instead of providing a one-to-one -one credit, meaning that for every kilowatt hour that the homeowner sends back to the grid, they get a kilowatt hour back in credit, they changed it to something like, well, we'll give you a quarter of a credit for every kilowatt hour that you send to us. And in these scenarios, you can no longer fully offset 100% of your home's consumption simply by designing a solar panel system that produces the same amount of kilowatt hours over a year period as you'd otherwise consume. Instead, you would actually need to consider adding batteries to store the excess power that your system produces during the daytime hours and then rely on that battery's stored electricity to provide power to your home during non-solar production hours. If you live in a market which still has one for one net metering, so most parts of Florida, Texas, or the Northeast, I strongly encourage you to appreciate it and really take full advantage of it because most utility companies are moving away from offering this program over time, 
kind of as more people adopt solar in these areas and the programs can simply not last forever. It's extremely important to speak with your solar consultant about what your specific net metering program means because it will impact drastically how you design that solar panel system and whether or not you might need to use batteries. Transitioning into the third common mistakes that I see first time solar homeowners make, I wanna talk about not choosing the right number of solar panels for their home and specifically not choosing enough panels. If you've already started shopping for solar, you've likely noticed that most solar installers will ask to see your home's historic kilowatt hour usage, usually found on your utility bill. And then from there, they'll use a the software to design a system that produces that same amount of power over a year's period, at which point they present that system to you. This approach is fairly standard, but in my opinion, somewhat novice. The reality is, as I mentioned earlier, we need to think about our solar panel systems as a long-term solution for reducing reliance on the utility grid. Designing a solar panel system to offset 100% of your home's last 12 months usage is fine, but does it account for long-term changes in your energy needs? The trend of home electrification is stronger than ever, and more homeowners than ever are transitioning from natural gas or propane to using electric for their larger loads. Whether it's switching to heat pumps, electric appliances, or even charging the EV at home, many people are seeing their electricity usage increase over time, and planning for that increase when designing your solar panel system is essential. Also, don't forget that solar panels degrade over time. The best panels on the market today may only degrade by about 8 to 10% over 25 years, but many commonly sold panels can degrade upwards of 20% over a 25 year period. Obviously, it's not going to make sense to drastically oversize your system to the point where you're paying for panels that you don't need, but shooting for 105 to 110% offset can be a great solution if you want to take into account your future needs. One thing to know is that many utility companies across the country prohibit solar contractors from selling systems that exceed 120% offset. However, oftentimes, if you can provide the proper justification forms and sign off on it, it's fairly common to get approval. On the topic of designing your solar panel system, let's move on to the fourth common mistake that homeowners make when going solar, which is having a poorly thought out solar system design. Unfortunately, since there's little regulation in the industry regarding the education that solar representatives need to have to design and sell solar, I often see systems that just do not make sense when it comes to maximizing production and benefits of solar panels. Here's an example. After only a few minutes of browsing aerial footage on Google Maps in Southern California, I found a system design like this. What do you guys think is wrong with this design? Well, let's start with the obvious. The panels are only installed on the eastern face of the roof. What this means is that the system's production will likely only be substantial enough to power the house for around 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. If we use an irradiance mapping software to analyze this house, we can actually find that the majority of sunlight falls on the southern face of the roof, which was completely avoided for no apparent reason. Worst of all, this property is in San Diego, a market with a time of use electricity program that charges nearly double the cost of power during the afternoon hours from 4 to 8 p.m. Wouldn't it make sense to place some panels on the western face of the roof where the sun shines during those critical hours? Apparently the designers didn't think so. This is just one example of many poorly designed systems, often resulting from uneducated solar representatives or companies that are lazy, don't care about their customers, and just wanna design a system that can be easily installed on the largest face of the roof. While avoiding placing panels on the front of your house is understandable for aesthetic reasons, if you want a design that maximizes production and maximizes your daily independence from the grid, that will oftentimes require multiple separate arrays on different areas of your roof. For most homes, this will mean placing the majority of the modules on the south face of the roof, followed by the west and the east facing sides, just depending upon where you live and what your shading situation looks like. In northern states, it can be very beneficial for homeowners with high summer usage to consider optimizing for western facing panels where a lot of that sun is gonna be focused towards that time of the year. It's also essential to consider daily utility rates and time of use programs when determining the best panel placement for your system, because if there are times during the day where we're paying double, if not triple the cost of power, we're really gonna to wanna to design a system that produces power during those hours. A little secret that I'll tell you guys is that unfortunately there are many cheap solar design softwares out there, which typically overpromise the production of the system as they do not take into account all of the things which affect solar production, such as shading, LIDAR, and the path of the sun. If you've received a solar proposal and the design image looks like a bunch of little black rectangles on a satellite non-3D image at the top of your house, that design is likely not taken into account many factors and could be drastically overpromising what the system will produce. Look for a design that uses technologies such as 3D imaging, irradiance and LIDAR shade metrics, and one that takes into account the path of the sun throughout the day, as for that design will likely project the most accurate numbers as far as what your system will actually produce. And by the way, guys, if you are in the process of shopping for different solar panel options for your home and you would like to get one of these advanced designs and proposals, or maybe you already have a few bids and you would like to simply receive a comparison quote just to make sure that you're getting a good deal, feel free to reach out to me by using the link below in the video and you can see if we provide installation services in your state. And then from there, you can book a quick call with myself and we could review one of these advanced designs of your property.
three. Moving on to the fifth mistake homeowners commonly make when going solar, let's talk about not choosing the right inverter for the project. When many homeowners consider going solar, they tend to focus on the solar panels or the batteries, often overlooking the inverter. And in my opinion, the inverter might just be the most critical component within a solar panel system. Without getting too technical, solar panels produce power in direct current, DC, but our homes are wired in alternating current, AC, and so the power needs to be converted from DC to AC before it can power the loads in your house. So this is where inverters come in. Inverters have evolved significantly over time and there are now several types available. For residential rooftop installations, the three main types of inverters that you'll find are microinverters, hybrid inverters, and then finally string inverters, which are oftentimes paired with power optimizers. I know this might sound confusing and I've made other videos comparing these systems in detail. However, what you'll need to know is that each inverter has its own pros and cons. And for that reason, there's no best inverter. It just depends on your specific needs. For instance, if you're installing a solar only system, the best inverter for your project might be different from what would be best if you're looking into a large backup storage system. It's essential to discuss the available inverter options with your solar consultant to really find what's best for your home. If a company is really pushing hard to sell one particular inverter and isn't offering alternatives, it's likely the only inverter that they can sell. And in that case, you might want to look elsewhere for a solar installer. That brings us into point number six and the sixth mistake that homeowners make, which is going to be picking a bad solar installer to work with on your project. You've probably found this while gathering bids for solar, but in 2025, there are hundreds of solar installers to pick from, which could potentially bid you a system for your house. And they're not all created equal. The thing with residential solar recently is that it's been such a booming business over the past five to 10 years due to increasing the Demand, along with how much the electricity rates continue to go up all across the country. And so for that reason, contractors who previously worked in home electric or roofing have gotten into the solar business, but not necessarily with the best intentions. The truth is solar is primarily a sales driven business. And so many solar companies rely on large door to door sales teams or phone solicitation companies to bring them customers. Therefore, their sales pitch often focuses less on how their specific equipment package will benefit the homeowner and more on offering a low monthly payment that beats what the homeowner was previously paying to the utility company. Company. Because of this, many solar installers get away with selling cheap solar panels, inverters, and batteries, and having very poorly installed solar panel systems, but homeowners just don't know the difference. And while many of these companies may promise long and valuable warranty packages, homeowners often fail to realize that these warranties are only as good as long as the solar company backing them is around. So if the solar company goes out of business, those warranties are worthless. What I see all the time, and unfortunately there's no regulation to prevent it, are solar companies propping up in hot markets, employing large sales teams to solicit as many potential customers as possible, and then exiting the market once they've exhausted all the potential leads. And by declaring themselves out of business, they can walk away from all of the obligations tied to the warranties that they sold to the homeowners. And then all they'll do is they'll simply move to a new state and then start the same business under a different name and just repeat the process. And this creates a worst case scenario for homeowners because they're sold cheap equipment, often at very high and borderline gouging prices, only to lose the warranty package that they were promised and kind of be left stranded without support. To avoid this, it's crucial to work with a company that you know will be around for the foreseeable future. Looking for factors such as how long they've been in business, their reputation, and the size of the area they service are all very good things. And nationwide contractors, so those that operate across multiple states, can often be a better safe bet to avoid these pitfalls. They typically have longer industry experience, better pricing due to economies of scale, and a more sustainable business model since they're not limited to one small market. That said, this is not a blanket statement that all nationwide contractors are better than the small and local contractors. In fact, last year, a few nationwide contractors went bankrupt, just like many of the smaller ones. But this is why every solar company that you work with needs to be thoroughly vetted. And as always, if you'd like to be connected with one of these contractors, which we've personally vetted, feel free to reach out to me by using the link below in the video. And we'd be happy to assist you by providing a proposal from one of our trusted partners. Moving on to the final and perhaps most important mistake to avoid when going solar, I want to talk about picking the right solar panel for your project and how to make the best choice. As I mentioned earlier, there are often three or four main components of the solar system. So the solar panels, the inverters, the racking system, and potentially a battery. And of these components, solar panels are kind of unique because their performance can very much depend on the local climate. You see, solar panel adoption is happening worldwide. And because of this, different panels have to be engineered to perform differently to perform optimally in different climates. Not only do solar panels vary in wattage, but they also differ in size size, durability, temperature coefficient, and even cell level technology. So the best solar panel for a market like Oregon it's certainly not the best panel as for a place like Arizona. It's crucial for homeowners to understand this and really consider their location when selecting a solar panel option. In a place like Florida, 
choosing a panel with a good temperature coefficient, meaning a panel that performs well at high temperatures is important. And it's also important for the panel to be durable. Though on the other hand, in a place like Colorado, you might wanna look towards selecting a panel that's strong enough to handle heavy snow loads, which requires a completely different type of panel. There are many other factors to consider when selecting a panel, and I know it can be very overwhelming. So to help out, make sure to check out my video going over the best solar panels of 2025, in which I go over which solar panels are best and kind of which solar panels are best for each individual market given their various ratings. That video will pop up on the screen now. But as always, thank you guys so much for watching and I'll see y'all next time.